My eldest son was six before he started school in this country. We'd been living in Turkey for some years where, as in many countries, formal education starts later. Coming back here, he had some catching up to do, but this didn't seem to disadvantage him. And it made me think that perhaps starting school later is a good thing. Research <coughs> suggests that it's a good thing, especially for boys. After just a year in school, however, my son became a cause for concern. He started to exhibit anxious behaviours. His head dropped. He stopped looking people in the eye and talking to them. In short, the light in his curious bright eyes went out. He was only seven. I wondered what was happening to my lively little boy. Living in Turkey, I'd imagined this little local school that the boys would go to. In reality, it was disappointing. The curriculum was narrow, with its primary focus on numeracy and literacy, and little time and value given to other subjects, especially the creative curriculum. And there was so much pressure on schools, even then, to teach to test. Pressure that was felt by head teachers, by teachers, and inevitably by children, too. <coughs> It was as we looked around for alternatives that we made a discovery. In British law, it is the responsibility of parents to provide an education suitable to a child's age, aptitude and ability, either by regular attendance at school or otherwise. It is this word, otherwise, that I want to celebrate this evening. It is the liberty that we have as parents to choose to do things differently. Culturally, we tend to think of learning as taking place in schools because that is the experience that most of us have had. Most of us went to school. We think of education happening at school and because education is seen to be a good thing, then schools must be good, right? And children have to go to school, we reason. It's good for them. We went. We survived. We turned out all right, mostly. This is how we think. <coughs> it's pretty much a given in our culture. But what if learning happens outside of schools? What if we take education out of the schooling box? Whilst we want children to learn, because education is a good thing, what if school is not? What if school is a place where a child is anxious, where a child is bullied, where a child is in sensory overload? What if school is a place where I just don't fit, where I don't feel safe, that doesn't recognise my talents, that tells me every day I am not good enough? Those don't sound like very good conditions for learning to me. So let us just imagine Imagine living differently, learning, creating, growing, without schooling. <coughs> our family didn't have to imagine very long. We made the decision to take our older boys out of school and to take responsibility for their education ourselves. We now have four boys and the younger two have never been to school. <coughs> So what happens to children learning outside of school? Well, when we took the boys out, we envisaged a very different way of learning, not just swapping the school curriculum for another, but rather building an education around our children's interests and the things that we encountered in our life together. This is not doing school at home, as the homeschooling label <coughs> implies. This is autonomous learning, it's child-initiated learning, delight-directed learning. This is unschooling. Critics of unschooling often make it sound as if we are limiting our children's opportunities, but let's turn that around for a minute and consider whether the school walls might be limiting some children. Not just the physical walls of the building, but the constraints of the curriculum the limited expectations of teachers and of testing. The predicted grades written on the front of children's exercise books. 
The necessity to be indoors most of the time and mostly sedentary. The disconnect from the natural world, from the real world of work, from other adults, the elderly, children of different ages. Critics of home education suggest that children won't be able to socialise if they're not in school, as if there are no other ways in which children mix than with their immediate peer group within the confines of school. Our children's socialisation is broad and less constrained by age. I wish you could all see a group of unschooled children learning together and helping one another. Unschooling does not mean isolation. We get together with other families to play and to undertake project work together. Our children are out and about in the community and they take part in many clubs and activities. In fact, as unschoolers, our community is our greatest resource and we're always looking for people who share our children's interests and passions. <coughs> Unschooling is really about learning to see the whole world as our child's classroom. As we visit interesting places, read and discuss interesting <coughs> things, watch things together and talk about all that we encounter, children learn. That is what they do. From the moment children arrive in the world, they're learning to make sense of it. Sometimes they need us by their side to discuss something, to help them to access information and to answer their questions. Sometimes we just need to get out of the way. It is possible to get in the way without even intending to, to disrupt the learning process with our preconceived ideas, our limited understanding, our targets and our time constraints. As we lay a feast of interesting ideas for our children. We expect them to run ahead of us and to discover more than we know. We lift them onto our shoulders, inspiring their curiosity and supporting their learning so that they can see further than we can. People often say to me when they hear that we home educate, well, how do you get your children to do anything? I can't even get my kids to do their homework. But unschooling is about tapping into intrinsic motivation. As we're building learning around our children's interests, we find we're going with the natural flow rather than against it. Intrinsic motivation is the simple delight of mastery. It is my unschooled son serving persistently a hundred times across an empty tennis court purely because he wants to master that particular skill. That same motivation pushed him to learn to ride a bike without stabilizers and to read. Don't ask me how, but he learned to read. He wasn't taught, although we read a lot of books together and we still do. He was eight before he became an independent reader. Do we think that's late or does it not really matter? As long as he loves to read and he experiences the satisfaction of having accomplished that skill for himself. Real learning always starts with the learner. It has to. It is not completing work for, that's assigned arbitrarily for fear of punishment or petty rewards which procure our compliance, whether that reward is an A grade or a job promotion. In fact, John Holt, a pioneer of the unschooling movement, suggests that the ignoble aim of such incentives is the satisfaction of feeling that we are better than someone else. So those of us that get an A do so as others get a D. Those of us that succeed do so as others fail. As one student said to her teacher, looking at her predicted grade F, what's the point? What is the point? We try to find sticking plaster solutions to low self-esteem to the chronic mental health crisis in our children. But we fail to question schooling, an institution so fundamental to their daily lives that it seems to be above scrutiny. You've probably heard the story of an old man walking across a beach covered with starfish that had been washed up by the tide. He sees a young boy walking towards him 
stooping occasionally to pick up a starfish and to throw it back into the sea. Amused, the old man observes, there must be tens of thousands of starfish on this beach. I don't really think you're going to make much of a difference. And the young boy bends down, picks up yet another starfish and throws it as far as he can out into the ocean. And he looks up and smiles and he says, I made a difference to that one. It can feel a bit like that with unschooling. We are parents striving to do the best for our children, sometimes by choice, and sometimes because the system has so failed our children that we see no other choice. The children are like starfish. We are making a difference to the one or two, the few whose worlds we can change. To them we make all the difference. But unschooling is not just for the one or two starfish. It's for all the starfish washed up on the beach and for those swimming free in the ocean as well. It's for those for whom the system works as much as for those for whom it doesn't. It's really nothing short of a grassroots revolution that sees us all as independent, lifelong learners who know that whatever we want to learn, we can learn it. We want to be problem solvers, people who see a problem and find solutions. My son wanted a scooter, so he built one over the summer from scratch, out of junk. And next he wanted to build a hydrogen generator. How do we go about that? Unschooling is about utilising all the resources that we have access to. The other morning I came downstairs and he was sitting at the table with his back to me, with his headphones in, looking at his phone. And I felt sure he must be watching some rubbish on YouTube. <laughs> It turns out he was watching YouTube, but to research some chemical formulae that he was puzzling over, not something that I know anything about. Technology has revolutionised education. <laughs> and this is why we must lay out a totally new vision of education for the 21st century. Such a vision might include using modern technologies to encourage and support individualised learning. with many more adults drawing alongside our young people as much needed mentors, facilitators, fellow learners, rather than teachers. Where each child is free to follow a course of study best suited to their talents and interests and aptitudes. Spaces where children can tinker and play, exploring and discussing ideas, where they can share their thoughts and fears, their <coughs> ideas, and dreams, learning hubs, learning communities, many mentors. Think of the potential. Rather than shutting them down, we need to enable young people to find their unique voice, to ask the questions that they are curious about, supporting them in finding answers and in making sense of their worlds. Acquiring the skills that they need to live and thrive and function in the 21st century, equipped to do jobs that we do, do not even know will yet exist. <coughs> My youngest son is four. His primary means of learning is asking questions. He doesn't stop talking from dawn to dusk. At the moment, he's interested in the ancient Egyptians, pyramids, shapes, numbers. If we can slow down and let go of our own objectives enough to listen, if we can take the time to answer his questions and to build learning into that line of child-initiated inquiry, then we find ourselves on a learning journey far deeper than we ever knew at school. And along the way, as children make connections and grow in understanding, they construct a rich web of learning, far exceeding our expectations. The richest element of unschooling is undoubtedly quality conversation enjoyed in relationship. Telling children to sit down and be quiet, which is inevitably necessary in classrooms as they exist today, with so many children to manage and the pressures of the curriculum to cover, we can actually shut down a child's primary means of learning without even realising it. No wonder that heads drop down 
and the bright light of curiosity goes out. After seven years out, my eldest son has just returned to school this term. Ever the engineer, he's gone into a local engineering academy to gain qualifications. I have to admit I was anxious. Having taken him out of the box, how would he fit back in? But he's flying. Perhaps most importantly, he's chosen to be there. He's utilising the school as just one more resource to help him to achieve his learning objectives. He is motivated intrinsically to utilise the opportunity to achieve his own goals. And he has just built the hydrogen generator. <laughs> Not for extra marks or because it's on an exam paper, but for the pure challenge and fun of doing it. Our politicians talk about education provision which caters to the needs and abilities of every child. And their solution is more good schools. What do these good schools look like? Schools have been around for a relatively short amount of time, historically speaking. And when we look at the mental health crisis in our children, at the dropped heads and the predicted grade Fs, we could say it is a failed social experiment. Perhaps for a truly radical approach to education in the 21st century, we need to take education out of the schooling box, building learning communities that recognise the value of every member of our societies. Supporting individualised learning and relationships in the real world, beyond the school walls. And if we truly want to give parents more choice, then we should definitely be talking more about unschooling. Thank you.